afternoon, everyone. I am so pleased that you are all here for the Humanities, the Humanity Sciences and Personhood track our afternoon session. We have three wonderful presentations queued up for you, starting with one with Myron Penner, Philosophy, Trinity Western University, April Cordero, Biology, Point Loma Nazarene University, and Amanda Nichols, Chemistry, Oklahoma Christian University. They'll be presenting on the, sex, the science of sex determination and the human person. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you all for uh, coming to our talk and I want to begin today just by acknowledging uh, some uh, partners that were helpful in, in accumulating, accumulating this research. Uh, this uh, talk is based on a paper that grew out of a project funded by University of St. Andrews a Science Engaged Theology Initiative uh, that was specifically focusing on theological anthropology, uh, and as many good things are, that was funded by the John Templeton Foundation. Uh, here's an overview of what we're going to be doing today. We're going to start with uh, some philosophical and theological preliminaries, just get some concepts out on the table, uh, and then I'm going to hand... Uh, things over to the scientists who are going to talk about environmental influences on sex expression, uh, as well as genetic variation of sex expression in humans and the epigenetic contingency of sex expression for humans and kind of uh, talk through some of, of what we've learned through uh, this research. And then we're going to wind up with thinking through uh, some applications, both theological and philosophical, of the science for how we should think uh, about human persons. So one thing that we wanted to start with uh, is to just note that uh, philosophers uh, like to point out, let's see here, why are we not advancing? There we go. Uh, so philosophers sometimes find it useful to pay attention to this distinction between uh, essential properties of a thing and contingent properties of a thing. And this is adjacent to two other concepts that philosophers often find helpful to point out. And that's just the distinction between the actual how things are actually unfolding versus the merely possible. Uh, a possible scenario is something that could have happened, but perhaps hasn't, right? And so the actual refers to how things are, and the merely possible refers to alternative ways things could have been. And this is relevant to this distinction between essential properties of a thing and contingent properties of a thing. And so if something is an essential property of an object, uh, however that object continues its, its career through life, the essential properties are going to be with it throughout its whole career. But a contingent property of something is a property that something could acquire over time, perhaps lose, uh, and there are multiple different scenarios in which an object can change contingent properties over time. So essential properties, a thing has uh, come what may. Contingent properties, uh, something that could be acquired or lost uh, at different times. We thought it would be important to just to uh, talk about our approach to science-engaged theology. And many of you will be familiar with uh, the Wesleyan quadrilateral. And our particular spin on the quadrilateral is what we're calling a domain-specific, non-hierarchical Wesleyan quadrilateral. And the Wesleyan quadrilateral, of course, points out four different sources of authority uh, that can guide our thinking uh, as Christians, and they are scripture, reason, uh, experience, and tradition. And we, call, we want to point out that our, our interpretation of the quadrilateral is to look at these authorities as domain-specific. And by that, we mean that each domain, whether it's scripture, reason, or uh, experience, has its own area of expertise. There are some things that scripture is wired to do, some things that reason, experience, and so on are particularly suited for. Uh, and we say that, that our approach to the quadrilateral is that it's non-hierarchical, which is to say you can't pick one of these authorities and hold it over over all of the others in every circumstance. There are gonna be some situations where scripture should take the lead. There are gonna be some situations where reason, including science, should, should take the lead, uh, experience, and so on. Uh, we also make a distinction between the first three, scripture, reason, and experience, on kind of one axis and tradition on the other, which is to say that uh, we, we like to think about tradition as the perspective of people in places and times other than our own on scripture uh, reason uh, and experience. And here we quote uh, the rabbi Mordecai Kaplan, the ancient authorities are titled to a vote, uh, but not a veto. And so that's uh, how we are thinking about these different domains uh, as they're working together. Thanks, Myron. Thanks, Myron. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about environmental influences on sex expression. 
So for many species, being biologically male or female at a time is a contingent property that depends on environmental factors. Uh, if the environment were to change, the sex expression would also change. So I'm gonna share two examples we see in nature. Um, that's how we're gonna start off today. So um, this is an example, you might be familiar with this. Um, this happens in a type of fish, the blue-headed wrasse. So on the left, you see a yellow fish, that's the female, um, it's smaller than the male. And then the male fish has that white black stripe with the blue head, it's larger as well. And in some um, of these you know, uh, you know, fish groups, they have a harem. So they'll have a harem of many females, one male, the male mates with the females um, to reproduce. If something happens to the male fish, uh, one of the females will transition to become the male of the harem. And so uh, on the right side, you can see the female um, that top yellow smaller fish and about eight to 10 days will transition into a um, male blue-headed wrasse. The female is going from a fully functional reproductive female uh, all the way to a fully functional reproductive male. Another example that we see in nature has to do with turtles, um, and specifically the temperature that the eggs um, are um, at. So this is uh, a red-eared slider turtle. Uh, so uh, if, you know, when an egg, if we consider one egg, it's been laid uh, in the ground, early gonad has not gone down a female, typical female path or a typical male path yet. Um, and the, if, if it's just a, you know, normal or average temperature. It's about a 50-50 split in terms of uh, half the eggs will end up as female, half will end up as male. But scientists have discovered that if the temperature uh, that the eggs are at, so the ambient temperature, will determine what pathway, and so most of the eggs will follow a certain pathway. So if the temperature is raised a few degrees, up to 31 degrees Celsius, you have um, the, the eggs will go to the female pathway and the gonad will turn into an ovary. Uh, and then if the temperature drops by a little bit, it will um, go down the male pathway and develop into a testes. And so here's an example where the environmental factor, the temperature, determines what pathway um, is going to be developed in terms of sex. So those are examples that we see, right? Um, we're talking about fish, we're talking about turtles, but what about humans? So this is a question that we were interested in in this project, and could a human zygote have followed a pathway of sex determination different from the path it followed in the actual world? So are humans like turtles and fish in this respect? Thank you. So I'm going to start by, my name's April, giving you a little reminder of Bio 101. Egg, sperm come together and make a zygote. The zygote has all of the DNA. The DNA gets copied and that one cell splits and make two cells. Now two cells have all the same DNA, correct? We, those copy, the DNA gets copied, splits four. Now we get eight cells, 16 cells. You with me on this? Remember that? Okay, so this is the pathway of uh, um, how we get development in utero. So. Sex determination and the development of gonads leading to male or female anatomy depends on whether genes get expressed or not at different times and places in the course of development. So what does that really mean? Well, if you start with the embryo any time before about week five, six, that embryo has all of the information and cannot be differentiated anatomically or physiologically as whether it's going to be typically male or typically female. If you looked at the genetics, you could see the XX or the XY chromosome. As you recall, XX was female. XY tends to be typically male, right? Um, but if you look at it physiologically, that embryo could follow either pathway at that point. It is around week six that some differentiation starts to begin. 
And so to better, best understand sex determination, I often try to use the analogy of like a Rube Goldberg, where you have a gene that gets expressed, and there's a protein, and that protein then binds onto DNA and expresses another gene, and then another protein binds onto DNA and expresses another gene, and you sort of get this signaling pathway. And at about week six, we start triggering the signaling pathway, which can typically go on a female pathway or a male pathway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit more detail than that and then talk about a non-typical pathway. So I want you to just focus on your left, this side. And I just want you to look in, and these, these uh, WNT1, WNT4, these are proteins. This is related to those signaling pathways in the DNA. Let's just look at the top. WT1, in all males and females, this is a gene, and it gets released around week five, six in mammals. And if we follow along the top, it triggers a protein, it triggers a protein, and it triggers a WNT4. When WNT4 gets triggered, it sort of locks it into a female pathway, typically, and you end up with ovaries and following the typical anatomy of female. An alternate is if you are an XY individual, a typical pathway is that, WNT, that WT1 that both uh, XY and XX individuals have will bind onto that Y chromosome. SRY is then a protein that gets triggered and expressed. SRY then triggers something called SOX9 and FGF, and we get this signaling loop, which is a self-sustaining loop, which causes the embryo to then usually typically follow into the male pathway and you get male anatomy and physiology and testes. Interesting thing about that signaling pathway, either one, is it represses the other pathway. So as you will see that line going up with that pair of scissors, if you follow that bottom pathway, when you get into that uh, self-sustaining latch, uh, where the DNA is, you know, they, they're signaling each other SOX9 and FGF, it represses the female pathway. So in each egg, and in mean, each individual has the whole female pathway involved, and it, the male pathway will repress that female pathway if SOX9 and FGF are expressed. So far, so good? Okay, this is the typical thing that happens but let's talk about the other side of the screen. Imagine an XY individual, and you can, we see this in nature, we see this happening um, with mammals, um, but we can also induce this with mice. You can increase that WNT4 in an XY individual mouse, and you can result in female genitalia. You can, in an XY individual, have a mutation that occurs on the SRY gene, which prevents that pathway going typical male, and you end up having a female genitalia. You can also have an XX individual that we see in nature, and the SRY ends up on the X chromosome. And this would happen at the production of the egg. We get crossover, and that little piece of SRY gene from the Y just gets put on the X. And what we end up is seeing a XX individual that has male genitalia, because it ended up following that bottom pathway where SOX9 FGF signaling occurred. Or you can have, uh, because of a genetic mutation, you can have an increase in androgens. Um, CAH is an increase in particular hormones that lead to ambigu ambiguous genitalia. So there's a, while there's a typical pathway for a typical male and a typical pathway for a typical female, uh, and then we have the non-typical pathways, uh, as a result of different contingent factors, I can result in the non-typical pathways being followed. All right, so... We just talked about some genetics and some things that can happen in the genetics, but what about epigenetics? So epigenetics has to do with a change to the molecular structure of the DNA, not a change to those DNA molecules. So those nucleotide bases, A, C, G, and T, isn't changing. The structure of the DNA is changing. So this image is just showing you a chromosome with chromatin and their histones. You don't need all the details, but we can add little molecules to the histones. Um, it causes a uh, change in the structure and if that DNA gets expressed or not. We can also have DC DNA methylation and that will also tell us if the DNA gets expressed or not. And so these are things that can influence what occurs 
without changing the actual molecules of DNA, nucleotide bases. All right, so then we ended up with the question, epigenetic contingency of sex expression, can that happen in humans? Can we have these changes occur in humans? Well, what we can do is look at mice. And so if you look at the right side of the screen, it's a pretty complicated image that you know, I can explain later to individuals that would like an explanation. But what we see in mice is that exactly what I said early on, you have an embryo that can become either a typical male or a typical female early on in its development. And messages uh, cause genes to get expressed proteins that lead it to a typical pathway. We can with epigenetic factors, histone modification, which is the left side on the bottom or the right side of the bottom, the female genes and the male genes exist, not talking about the X and Y, just all the genes in our system. In a typical male, the female genes get repressed through histone modification, or the male genes can get repressed through histone modification. Uh, also resulting in leading to one of these pathways. So studies show that the effects on sex determination in mice can be because of regulation of SRY, the gene, via methylation, not because of genetic modification, but methylation, or regulation of SRY via histone modification, not a genetic mutation. So what about humans? Well, we cannot go in the lab and do these kinds of changes, obviously, experimental changes with humans. We see it with the mice, and we can do these histone modification changes with mice. And so the assumption is, if we could do this with humans, would we see that we could influence that developmental pathway in utero? So back to Myron. So we have just a few minutes remaining, and I want to uh, wrap this up, or we want to wrap this up by thinking through what does the science teach us or suggest to us about uh, what it means to be a human person? Ooh, back up. So one thing is that, uh, as we've seen through the backdrop of nature, uh, extreme contingency of sex expression uh, and sex transition across lifespan uh, uh, is commonplace in nature. It's a widespread natural phenomena for many species with uh, whom humans share DNA uh, and, com and common ancestry. Uh, it shouldn't be surprising then to find genetic and epigenetic factors for contingent sex expression in Homo sapiens, uh, as we have with mice uh, and rabbits. So, what is that? What you know? How can we apply that to thinking about human persons? Well, biologically male uh, and biologically female uh, are not universally clear either-or descriptors uh, for humans, uh, and there doesn't seem to be any biological basis for uh, a fixed uh, universal um, gender essentialism. What about having genetic potential to express uh, a different biological sex? Well, the genetic information and potential to express sex differently is present uh, in Homo sapiens as it is with other species, for which sex transition is commonplace and sex determination is highly susceptible uh, to a range of environmental factors. Typical pathway male mammals, right? Humans who have followed a typical developmental male pathway have genes capable of facilitating female sex expression. It's just that typical pathway males will suppress these genes across lifespan. And similarly, typical pathway female mammals have genes capable of facilitating male sex expression. Typical pathway females will suppress these genes across lifespan. So the, the paths are parallel and both present, it's just that one is uh, suppressed. As we've seen with the fish, the parallel paths are there and they have easy access between one uh, and the other. So what we think this means is that there's no basis, uh, no biological basis for ontological injustice, right? Treating those who follow atypical biological pathways uh, as you know, uh, ontologically less than in their capacity of being human persons. Uh, we also think that regardless of which uh, developmental road of sex determination one is actually traveling, uh, there are possible scenarios in which one could have followed a different developmental pathway, right? So this idea of if you rewound the tape of, a, of an individual's uh, or, uh, person's life and started from single cell zygote and ran it out uh, into multiple different scenarios, you could get a different path, a diff different developmental pathway uh, that is followed. And April gave a nice job of laying out different developmental pathways. So for homo sapiens, biological sex is uh, contingent in that sense. 
but also in the second sense, which is to say that regardless of which developmental road of, of sex determination one is actually traveling, uh, a different parallel path remains present uh, throughout lifespan. And so we think when it comes to thinking through what this means for human persons, uh, understanding the science should reduce, in some sense, the strangeness that some might feel at concepts like varying uh, sex expression across lifespan for humans, or perhaps even reduce some of the strangeness that some might feel at the idea of introducing environmental interventions, including surgery and medicine, to facilitate sex transition. So we want to end with uh, a reference to a trans theologian, Austin Hartke. And what we have here on the screen is a, a section from the, the manuscript of the paper that we've been working on. Uh, and what we say here is that given that sex transition is a commonplace, naturally occurring phenomenon among many species that reproduce sexually, Hartke, in his book, uh, Transforming the Bible and Lives of Transgender Christians, uh, who, who interestingly, uh, he talks about the blue-headed wrasse and the science of sex determination and speaks from his experience as a trans person, thinks through how this could all fit both biologically and theologically into uh, thinking about human persons and human populations. So he provides a model for thinking through how sex difference among human populations can fit within a wider biological and evolutionary context, uh, a model which can alleviate some of the cognitive dissonance people may experience when contemplating uh, various examples uh, of sex difference uh, and sex transition. So that is our paper. We don't have any time for questions, so thank you for coming. Don't worry, there are actually time for questions. Are there, sorry, I'll get out here. Are there any questions? We need to do it into the microphone for the people online. Would it be possible using uh, DNA results from like 23andMe and uh, Family Tree DNA Ancestry to find the probability that somebody could be, for example, XY, but have come out as female and vice versa? Hmm. So could we, um, is it possible to use DNA information through 23andMe, Ancestry.com, the kind of information to calculate the probability that someone is, following a non, is actually following a non-typical pathway? Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there are other ways to determine uh, whether or not a person is following a non-typical pathway. Interestingly, uh, what we see uh, sometimes when, uh, when, when a, you know, a couple is trying to conceive and there are fertility issues and they go in for testing, sometimes that's the first time that, that a person realizes that developmentally they're, um, they've followed a non-typical path. There's a super interesting example of a, a man, I believe, in his 70s, this was written up just within the last five years, uh, a you know, father of four, grandfather, uh, was going in for a hernia operation and during the ultrasound it was, it was discovered that he had a womb, right? So this is a person who had, you know, through all of lifespan into, into senior, senior life, it was discovered that he had followed a non-typical pathway. So, so I'm, I don't know in terms of using uh, DNA uh, data mean, to calculate probabilities. 23 and me. If, if it's looking, I have 23 me. I don't remember it telling me it's XX. This, who is 23 and me out there? Does it telling me I'm XX or XY? I don't recall that. It does not. Um, yes, if people went in for genetic testing, it would say if they're XX or XY. Um, but what do you do with that at that point? And that's always private information. So I don't believe it can be used for anything outside of that. I'm not sure that answers your question. Is, is any information really private though? No, yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. We have another question back here. Hi, thank you for addressing, sorry, thank you for addressing, um, which I think is a very important topic and the, lots of thorns and struggles. And so thank you so much. Um, this is a three part question, which probably the three of you can answer together. First is um, that I don't know anything about amphibians, but um, I think there are animal systems where there is fluidity, right? They can change gender and then change it back if the circumstances warrant it. And in humans, um, even with the environmental pressures on the epigenetics, it does have a time point when it, you know, when it's influential and after a certain deterministic point, development progresses and you have you have features that you just you know the person has and so um 
you know, how does the fluidity in animals compare to the lack of fluidity seen in humans? And then the third part would be, you know, how do we grapple with that f concept of fluidity in social circles when f gender fluidity is, is a part of our everyday conversation? Thanks. I'll do the bio. Do it. Okay, so you're absolutely right. So what we understand from mammal, mammal research and from the specialist capo when we went to her lab is that among the mammals that have been studied, we don't see the transition in the mammals after a particular time period. In fact, at about week six, week six, seven, in mice, there's a time period of about six hours where the typical female pathway would get diverted and change the typical male pathway. And if that window changes in mammals, that's it. It's following the typical male pathway. And it sort of gets locked in. And then there's a bunch of, she explained to us, the Capo Lab, who's a specialist in that, that there's a bunch of um, physiological mechanisms which actually prevent that transition to happening. Now, nobody, nobody knows why in mammals that's the case and why in amphibians and fish we see these abilities to transition between um, the typical male or the typical female. But we do know that it does sort of lock in at a particular phase. And But what you will end up with is there are some non-typical pathways. For example, an XX individual who has ambiguous genitalia and is raised up until puberty as a female because it seems that, you, that, that this is a typical female. And at puberty, uh, a bunch of uh, testosterone and other hormones get released that then cause the penis to develop. It then cause uh, the breasts to not develop. So the female pathway at that, eight, that time would get repressed. Um, or not develop in the way you'd expect. A lot of these individuals then actually choose to then follow a male um, lifestyle because they feel that their cells are fully male. So that's not a change. That person was always XY. It's just that early on the hormones didn't develop the anatomy of that XY individual until the hormones came at puberty time. So uh, just to maybe address the third part of your, your question, so the focus of our paper and our project was to really understand the biology and to, to get a good handle on what the, the, the best current science of sex determination is. Uh, and uh, we, we wanted to focus on the biology as opposed to starting with uh, social concepts of gender, which you know, obviously are, are different in different times and places, different social ideas about what you know, masculinity and femininity uh, count as. Uh, we wanted to focus particularly just on the biology. Uh, we think that the biology is relevant for larger social uh, conversations about gender simply because a lots of the discussion that happens at that level makes assumptions about how the biology works that really are not well-founded. Uh, and so, um, even, you know, all three of us have had different experiences talking about the blue-headed wrasse. And for some people who think that, you know, uh, bi uh, you know, biological sex is fixed at conception and uh, is immutable, pe for people who are unaware of the fluid fluidity in some species, it's actually quite alarming to them uh, because that's just not how they, they just made all sorts of assumptions about how biological sex works across all species. And so we think that there is value uh, in providing data for reflection on social issues uh, coming from uh, the science. I think the hook is coming. The, the hook is <laughs> Super Stern <easy>. Taskmaster. <laughs> Let's join and uh, join me in thanking our presenters, please.